You ever feel like things just aren't going right? You just don't know why. You've come to Christ. You've been baptized into Christ. You go to church. And yet it's just, life's not working right. Everything is tough. Everything is hard. I don't feel satisfied. I don't feel content. I'm always worried. I'm always struggling. It's just hard. I think we can see an analogy this morning in the book of Haggai. To really understand the book of Haggai, we also have to reach over into the book of Ezra. And so, I know those books may be a little bit difficult for you to find if you're flipping back in in paper Bibles. So maybe keep a finger in both of them. uh, Because we're going to be looking at a couple of different passages from each one. I want to give you a little bit of history, a little bit of background for where Haggai falls in the historical chronology of world history. You remember, you have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You have Jacob taking his family with Joseph into Egypt. 400 years, Moses, Egyptian slavery, Moses leads the Israelites out of Egypt, wander in the wilderness. Joshua leads them into the promised land. Period of Judges, period of Solomon and David, I mean Saul, David, and Solomon. And then the divided kingdom. And then the northern kingdom is carried off into captivity by the Assyrians. And the Assyrians make almost everybody leave their home. Almost all of the northern Jews are forced to leave if they survive and aren't dead have to relocate somewhere else. And then 150, 200 years later, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar finally conquer the southern kingdom, Judah, Jerusalem. And when they're conquered and they're carried into activity, the nation of Judah, that's where we get the term Jews. That's why Israelites are called Jews, because of the nation of Judah once it went into captivity. There were three deportations recorded in Scripture under Nebuchadnezzar. And you can go back and there are some histories, some secular, non-biblical histories, where you can match up a lot of this history and you can start to get pretty good dates for when things are happening. And it's pretty well established that the first deportation, which probably included the prophet Daniel, was about 605 B.C. And then you have a second one, about 10 years later, that probably includes the prophet Ezekiel going into Babylonian captivity. And then you have the last one, which is at the very end of the book of Jeremiah, where Jerusalem is completely leveled, the temple is completely burned and torn down, Jerusalem is a pile of rubble. That's about 586 B.C. So then you come forward about 30 years, and you have a man named Cyrus become prince of Persia. And the Medes and the Persians band together against the Babylonians. They overthrow Nebuchadnezzar's son and they take control and they establish a kingdom all the way from Egypt up and around the Mediterranean and all the way to India. A gigantic, a gigantic empire. And so that's Cyrus the Great. And Cyrus the Great, along with the Medes, conquer Babylon And Daniel records this in about 539 B.C. Okay, so that's where we are. So if you look here in the book of Haggai, you look at verse 1, it says, In the second year of Darius the king. Now, we usually say this name, Darius. When I first started hearing it, I heard it Darius, and so that's how I say it. I'm not doing it to sound smart or to confuse you. But he's called Darius the Great. And in probably it's Greek that they pronounce it that way. He's actually the fourth king since Cyrus the Great. Cyrus the Great's son, Cambyses, becomes king, goes into Egypt, and then comes back from Egypt, and he's king for about ten years from until about 522 
And then after him, there's one king for less than a year called Smyrtus or Bactria, if I got that name right. Bardia, I didn't get it right. Bardia. He's king for less than a year, and then a person from a different line, not a descendant of Cyrus, becomes king, Darius. And so in Haggai, we have Darius. So that tells us where we are. The first year of Darius is pretty well established at 522 B.C. And Darius had this, in, this huge inscription carved into the side of a mountain in eastern modern-day Iran, which was found, I think, in World War I or World War II. It was so hard to get to that nobody knew it was there. But he had this long history of his reign carved into the side of a mountain where nobody could destroy it. And so now we have a, a modern-day record contemporaneous with Darius's reign. So, that's where we are. We're in the second year, or in the second year of Darius the king. Now go with me back to Ezra. And Ezra and Haggai are a long way away from each other uh, in the Bible because the Bible is, is grouped by writing and Ezra is history and Haggai is prophecy. But chronologically, they overlap. They occur at the same time. If you go to Ezra chapter uh, 1, verse 1, it says, In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. So, you go all the way back to the first year of Cyrus the Great, and this is understood to be the first year that Cyrus the Great has control of the Jews. The Jews are counting this the first year that we were under Cyrus the Great. He says all the Jews can go back to Jerusalem. Okay. Come to chapter 2 of Ezra, verse 64. Chapter 2 is a long chapter. Chapter 2, verse 64. The whole assembly numbered 42,000 360 people. So under Cyrus the Great, 42,000 people leave the Persian Empire and they're dispersed over a wide area and they come all the way back to Jerusalem. Okay? Now you come back to Haggai. And we look at what Jack read earlier in verse 4. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate. So you have from about 538 probably, if the first year of Cyrus is 539, he issues the decree, the people get together, 42,000 come back. You're probably dealing with a year there until they get back. So you have 538 to about 521, the second year of Darius the Great. You have 17 years that this 42,000 people have been back in Jerusalem. And what does God say through Haggai? You're living in paneled houses. My house is in ruins. Why is my house in ruins? He says, you want to know why you don't have enough? Which is what Jack also read here in Haggai in verse 5 or verse 6. You have sown much but harvest little. If you come down to verse, um, verse 9, you look for much, but behold, it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why? declares the Lord of hosts. Because of my house, which lies desolate, while each of you runs to his own house. 
Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. I called for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labors of your hands. Why is it not working out for you, Israel? Why are things not going well for you? Because my house lies desolate. Because you've built your house and ignored mine. Because you've put your house ahead of mine. Because you've put your physical needs ahead of your spiritual needs. God must always take first priority. Always God must come first. And when He doesn't, nothing works right. Nothing goes well. Life is only happy for a very brief period of time until it goes off the rails when God's not coming first. When God is coming first, even when you don't have a lot to eat and you don't, even when you're living in captivity, you can be blessed and you can be happy and satisfied and protected and feel safe when God is coming first. Matthew 6, verse 33, But seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Well, I'm going to tell you a secret. They had a pretty good excuse. If you go back to Ezra, go to Ezra chapter 4, come to find out they actually started working on the temple when they first got there. Ezra chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8, uh, in the second year of their coming to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month, Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua son of Jozadak and the rest of their brothers, the priests and Levites and all who came from the captivity of Jerusalem began the work and appointed the Levites from 20 years and older to oversee the work of the house of the Lord. They started the work. You come forward to chapter 4, Verse 1, Now when the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the people of the exile were building a temple to the Lord God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the heads of fathers' households and said to them, Let us build with you, for we like you seek your God. And we have been sacrificing to him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Assyria, who brought us up here. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of fathers' households of Israel said to them, You have nothing in common with us in building a house to our God, but we ourselves will together build to the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building. They started, but then they stopped. They started the building, but then they stopped. And even after Haggai and Zechariah stir up the people to start building again. The people come back and they actually send a message to the king, to Darius the king. And they said, they're building this temple and this is a, this is a rebellious people where they always turn against and you won't get any more taxes. And they sent a letter, stop building. And the Jews sent a letter back saying, no, we were told we could build. And they do a search in the archives and they find Cyrus's decree in the archives. And Darius says, okay. You can keep building. But for 17 years, or 16 years, or somewhere like that, they didn't. They quit. What's your excuse? You see, the temple of God today, that's us. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 Verse 9 says, For we are God's fellow builders. You are God's field. God's building. You are God's building. You come down to verse uh, 16 of the same chapter, 1 Corinthians 3. He says, Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And that the Spirit of God dwells in you. So we're not talking about 
a physical building here. We're not talking about an altar and a place to offer sacrifices. We're not even talking about a church building. We're talking about people building. We're talking about faith building. We're talking about commitment building and zeal building and service building. You know, people have a lot of excuses. Very few of them are as good as the excuse, I'm going to get killed like the Jews had. And God still didn't bless them because they gave in to that excuse. I see a lot of people. Well, when I finish my education, you know, when I, get, when I get through school and I get on my feet and I get out on my own and I get settled in life, then I'm going to start giving some energy to the kingdom of God. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Same people, once they get out on the road and they start working, they say, well, I'm working on my career. When I get my career settled, when, when I start making enough money, and I, then I'm going to start giving my attention and my energy to the kingdom of God. Mark 4 Verse 19 talks about people who fall away from the church. And it's in the parable of the sower. It talks about the seed that gets thrown among the, the thorns. The thorns grow up and choke it. And when Jesus explains what the thorns are, He says, the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the Word and it becomes unfruitful. And guess what? The life becomes full of thorns. And it stops working right. And it starts producing the things that the life is intended to produce. Love and kindness and compassion and service and joy and peace and happiness and contentment. And it starts producing worry and fear and anxiety and jealousy and envy and anger and slander and gossip. Because the house of the Lord is being neglected. Because the temple of God is left unfinished. We have a lot of excuses. You come back to Haggai. Look at verse 12. Then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. See, the same exact people in Ezra with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people showed reverence for the Lord. Here's the good news. You still have time to change. You still have time to start giving the temple of the Lord the attention that it deserves. You have a chance to do what God calls you to do. Psalm 119, verse 11. Your word I have treasured in my heart that I may not sin. Fundamental part of people not building the temple of God in their own lives and in the congregation where God has put them is a failure to treasure the Word of God. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. What's important to you? What do you think is valuable? What do you think is worth a lot? If it's not the Word of God, if it's not the truth that God has freely given to you, your heart's in the wrong place. And the temple of God will crumble and you will suffer want and despair. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15 says, Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working 
of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Building the temple of God has everything to do with the Word of God, speaking the truth in love, and it has everything to do with you fulfilling your role in God's church, in the church that Jesus built. So that every joint supplies that which it is supposed to supply to the entire thing. The temple is each one of us. The temple is also the church. And if you're not in your place contributing what you need to contribute, the temple of God suffers. Tonight, maybe you think, well, I can't lead singing. I can't even carry a tune. I don't, there's nothing I can do. Can you say, I'm glad you're here? Can you, can you do that? You say, well, I can't cook. I'm not a good cook. I can't bring. Can you go to the store? They have cooked food already at the store. Everybody has a role to play. Amen. Everybody has something to contribute. And the temple of God suffers when they don't do it. Go back to Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. There's a bright future. Of course, I'm in Zephaniah. Haggai chapter 2, verse 7. Back up to verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Once more, in a little while, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of all nations, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. They rebuilt the temple. And it's the temple where Jesus walked. It's the temple where the Lamb of God came and declared the truth of the kingdom of heaven. It's the place where the apostles went and stood and proclaimed the truth of Jesus in this temple that they built. And it's an interesting thing because he calls the old timers there to look at it. And he says, now those of you who remember what it looked like before, it doesn't look as nearly as good, does it? It doesn't look nearly as good as it did when Solomon built it. And when you were taken off into captivity. These must have been really old people to be able to remember back that far. And they cried and they wept. But God says, don't worry. I'm going to fill it with glory. And He did. And He did. And the Redeemer of all mankind came and revealed the truth there. And He'll do the same through us. He will fill our temples with glory if we will build it for His purposes. If you are outside the saving grace of Jesus this morning, we invite you, Jesus invites you to come back. It's not too late. Jesus offers salvation freely to any who will put their faith in Him, who will live for Him and acknowledge Him as the Lord of hosts. You have to repent. You have to stop living for yourself and start living for Him. And the only thing left is the simple act of baptism. Immersion in water for the forgiveness of sin. If you need to come to Christ, if you need to return to Christ, please come down front as we stand and sing.